Hi, welcome to the capacity building training for decentralized growth monitoring and promotion in COVID-19 context. My name is Diane Bake, and I am the Senior Technical Advisor for Health and Nutrition with the TSO. The training today will cover why is GMP important, the challenges with GMP, the result of poor GMP, what is decentralized GMP, and we will go through a little case study and the experience of decentralized GMP in Burundi's context. And then we will go into how can we adapt GMP in COVID-19 context, specifically in complete restriction and mobility and in some restriction and mobility contexts. We will then go through the personnel support required, the budgeting and supervision required. So let's get started. Why is regular GMP important? GMP stands for Growth Monitoring and Promotion. The importance of regular GMP, which usually takes place monthly or quarterly, is to prevent malnutrition. What happens during regular GMP is screening for malnutrition of children under five regularly to identify growth faltering children. The second, reason for GMP is because it's to intervene with IYCF counseling when the child is growth faltering before the child is malnourished. The third reason is to refer the child to appropriate services and the timing is very important. We can't wait until the last minute when the child is on the brink of death to then refer the child to CMM services. We must continue to monitor the children regularly and refer them when needed before they get to that point. The challenges with GMP include that it's not done regularly. So it should take place monthly or quarterly, but in actuality, it takes place every six months or even once a year. The second challenge is that the coverage is very low. And the reason for low coverage may be due to long wait times for caregivers. The GMP posts are far in distance for many households, and so it's, it's very difficult to get to. And the GMP posts are centralized most times at the health center level, and so it's not easily accessible. There's also limited time of health, care, health, health center staff, or CHWs, and there's limited functioning equipment. There's also poor capacity in anthropometric measurements, such as for weighing, height measurement, and MUAC, and data analysis capability. There's also poor capacity in IYCF counseling, and it may not, very be, it may not be very helpful for caregivers, and so they don't attend. As a result of poor irregular GMP, there is poor identification of malnourished children, there is poor referral of children to appropriate services, and then as a result, there are high rates of all three types of malnutrition, including underweight, wasting, and stunting. So a good regularly functioning GMP is the foundation or should be the foundation of any program for nutrition. So what can we do? Decentralized growth monitoring and promotion is the solution that we are proposing. Decentralized GMP is an ongoing or regular GMP that takes place monthly or biweekly during crisis scenarios such as drought, pandemics, or tsunami scenarios, or it happens quarterly in normal, usual scenarios. There should also be an increase in the number of GMP posts per village, and there should be an increase in the number of trained personnel in GMP, specifically in taking anthropometric measurements and for IYCF counseling. We also need more functioning equipment. We need an increase in the number of days and hours for GMP services that are being offered. There needs to be a target of greater than or equal to 80% coverage for nutrition screening. There needs to be a strong monitoring system, and you can use an mHealth application, which we, we have already developed within World Vision, or a database, which we also have. You can also target under two children through decentralized GMP, 
but you could also include up to 59 months of age children. An example of decentralized GMP in some contexts is integrating GMP into savings groups or family groups. Many times savings groups or family groups or parent groups, mother support groups, they meet regularly. Most times they meet at least once a month. So what we have proposed and what we have done in some cases is to include GMP sessions during these times. And most times the savings groups, family groups, parent groups, or mother support groups are already targeting the under two households or under five households. And the caregivers attend these groups with their children. So as these caregivers are attending these groups and they start to arrive one at a time, the people that have been trained, whether they're volunteers or CHWs or mother leaders, they can measure the anthropometric measurements of the children slowly as the caregivers come one at a time. That way, as they're waiting for the next person to come to join the meeting, and before the, the meeting commences, you can take the measurements, the anthropometric measurements of all the children. You can also provide the IYC of counseling um, quickly if you have time. If not, then follow-up visits can be conducted for those children who have growth faltering. Next, I'll be taking us through World Vision Burundi's experience with decentralized GMP. I just want to thank Simon Pierre and Jean Bier from the MCNE project for sharing the information today. Just to give you a brief background around the project, it's called the Maternal and Child Nutrition Enhancements Pilot Project. It's funded by the World Bank through, or it's funded through the World Bank, but it's funded by the Japanese government through a trust fund, and it was $2.73 million for three years. It's covering two health districts, completely two health districts, and it's running from February 2017 to August 2020. The main objective of this project was to increase the production and consumption of micronutrient rich foods among under five households, focusing on the 1000 days and through three components, including mobilizing communities to improve nutrition practices, increasing the production of micronutrient rich foods and through project management and administration, monitoring and evaluation and knowledge dissemination. The interventions include decentralized GMP, PD Hearth, IYCF, family groups, biofortification, kitchen gardens, and savings groups. To give you a brief overview of Burundi's subdivisions, they first have uh, the, the overall country, national level, then they have the province, communes, hills, and subhills. Originally, GMP and PD Hearth was being conducted at the hill level and measurements such as MUAC and weight were being taken. However, they faced challenges in large number of child screenings being needed per hill, which resulted in long wait times for caregivers, long travel times to get to the GMP sites, and as a result, low coverage. Also, even with um, the low coverage, they would have high numbers of underweight and them children that need to be referred to PD Hearth programs, but because PD Hearth was being implemented at the Hill level, they could not include all the children who are underweight and MAM into a PD Hearth program. They have been using the PD Hearth GMP application to register children and to enter the weight and MUAC data, which then uh, refers back to the last MUAC and weight information that was entered and compares it to today's weight or MUAC data. If the child is growth faltering, then the phone would provide the, the right IYCF counseling messages to provide to the caregiver, depending on the questions that were answered previously. It also provides proper referrals to PD Hearth or CMAM if the child is identified as underweight or wasted. In year two, they decentralized GMP and PD Hearth to the subhill level. And so they decentralized from 114 hills to 512 subhills. 
They purchased additional PD Hearth and GMP kits, including the following items, and they trained more mother leaders in PD Hearth and GMP. They then used the trained mother leaders to run decentralized GMPs at schools, health centers, public centers, and even during savings groups. Now I'll be sharing a little bit about the data that we have from the PD Hearth and GMP application. With centralized GMP, they were initially monitoring 4,000 children per month. So this is just GMP at the hill level. But after decentralization all the way down to the sub-hill level, the monitoring has increased to approximately 19,000 to 21,000 children per month, which is more than four times increase in the number of children being screened per month. This is data from the Burundi's M Health application for underweight levels. You can see for the months of January, February, and March 2020, the total numbers of children that have been measured. And you can see in the graph the total number of normal children, mildly underweight, moderately underweight, severely underweight, and then overweight. We compared historical data that we have for underweight with um, more recent underweight data from the GMP app. And we found that there was a 6.3 percentage point reduction in underweight prevalence in just eight months. And this is at the population level data. This is not just PD Heart data, this is GMP data. So this is quite significant. So this is comparing in July 2019 with March 2020. Then we have wasting data through MUAC measurements. And we completed uh, over 21,000 children screened in January. Um, there was a dip. So there was around 8,781 8, children who were screened in February. And then increases again back to 14,400. And then it goes back to above 19,000 in April and May. I am guessing that in February there was a dip because of the COVID scare and even a little dip in March because of the COVID scare. Uh, and there may be other reasons that we are looking into now. But in April and May, it has continuously um, gone back up. So you can see that there's quite a high number of green MUAC and there's quite a low GAM rate. And you may think, wow, Burundi has extremely low GAM rates. But if we compare this data to one year ago, you will see that GAM rates were quite high in Burundi at the same time. So we're comparing April 2019 with April 2020. So if we compare these two months, one year apart, it, the GAM rate has decreased from 11.4% to 4.7% which is a 6.7 percentage point reduction, which is again, quite significant. World Vision Burundi has adapted the, their decentralized GMP to the COVID context, and they've distributed hand washing kits, including hand sanitizer and soap to their GMP sites. They are also maintaining one meter distance for waiting in line for GMP screening for caregivers and children. And I wanted to also highlight that their Ministry of Health, especially uh, at the national level, have been involved in the design phase all the way, all throughout the implementation. Um, and World Vision Burundi has been excellent in sharing the results, even with the provincial level and district level. And the government has been on board from the very beginning. And now um, the national level Ministry of Health did not have a GMP strategy, but with this project's implementation experience, results, their site visits, their active advocacy, World Vision Burundi was able to highlight the importance of decentralized GMP. And so Ministry of Health is now developing a national GMP strategy 
and will be decentralizing GMP across the country and will be contextualizing World Vision's guidelines and tools for their national guidelines and tools. So I just want to congratulate the great work that World Vision Burundi has been doing thus far. I will now take us through World Vision's priorities for management of malnutrition in the COVID-19 context. World Vision has three priorities. The first is to increase the coverage of prevention interventions, such as decentralizing nutrition screening or growth monitoring and promotion for early detection and providing IYCF counseling. The second priority is to strengthen and adapt PD hearth for rehabilitation of underweight children and in some settings to rehabilitate wasted children without medical complications if the management of wasting services are not available. The third priority is to sustain and adapt existing services for the early detection and treatment of wasting. The PD Hearth Plus adaptations are for two different scenarios. One is for complete mobility restriction and the second is for some or partial mobility restriction. The PD Hearth Plus components that have been adapted include IYCF counseling, decentralized GMP, and PD Hearth. For this training video, we will be touching only on decentralized GMP. So in the first scenario of complete restriction and mobility, the first recommendation is to use phone calls and to ask screening questions over the phone to identify and refer growth faltering children. You can refer to the Annex B in the PD Hearth Plus COVID-19 adaptation brief, and you will see eight different screening questions. On the top, you can see the columns. The first column is screening question. The second is concerning answer. The third is reason for concern. And the last is for next step or referral. The first question asks if the household has any child or children under the age of five or younger, and if so, what age is the child? And you'll see that a concerning answer is yes, and the reason is because children under the age of two are more at risk. However, as long as the household has children under five years of age, continue with the rest of the screening questions. And then it tells you the next step is to continue with screening questions. The second question is are any of your children unusually less active, unusually sleepy, or have had any loss of consciousness, had seizures, difficulty or rapid breathing, a stiff neck, or is not feeling at all, is not feeding at all, or vomits everything? The answer is yes, it is concerning. And it's concerning because the child has an underlying danger sign during child illness or is severely wasted. The caregiver needs to seek medical attention for this child immediately. And then you can refer the child to a hospital or CMAM services immediately, and then conduct a follow-up with the caregiver to ensure that the child was taken and you would do this follow-up the next day. Questions three and four have an asterisk beside them. The reason is because the corresponding asterisk says, note, if many households answer questions three and four with yes, consider starting a blanket supplementary feeding program to then be integrated with GMP and PD Hearth depending on the context. The question three and four are food security questions. The first one is asking for if there is a loss of primary source of income. And then the second question is asking if they're struggling to have enough food for everyone in the family. So this is a food security question but this directly affects the nutritional status of children because if they can't eat, then they'll become malnourished. That's why we have included these as screening questions for us. Question five asks, has your child been identified as malnourished or admitted to a nutrition treatment program in the past three months, such as PD Heart or CMAM? The answer is yes, it's concerning because a child who previously was underweight or wasted is at a higher risk. Question six, six asks, is your child showing loss of appetite or eating very little in the past two weeks? Concerning answer is yes. 
because poor appetite for, for food intakes oh, indicates a child who is unwell. Question seven asks, do you think your child is too thin or is becoming thinner than before? The concerning answer is yes. The reason is because a child who has recently lost weight or has faltered in growth is at increased risk. Question eight asks, have you ever breastfed your child? Or B, if, you, if no longer breastfeeding, when and why did you stop? And you can see the concerning answers and the reason here. If three or more of the answers from questions four to eight are concerning answers, then the child is most likely growth faltering and may already be underweight or wasted. So use the weekly follow-up phone calls to provide close IYC counseling and share six key hearth messages from Annex D, which I will go through later. And then the second step is to advise a caregiver to access available health and nutrition services such as PD Hearth or CMIM or other services that are available that the government is providing. I would also recommend to collect phone numbers for all the households with children under five in the community. Identify addi additional personnel to help with making GMP phone calls. Use a good monitoring system to track when the screening was done, which children are growth faltering, what type of IYC counseling messages was provided, referrals, so which child was referred, so that you can then follow up after the referrals. And this could be done through phone calls or home follow-up visits if possible. There is a World Vision GMP database on Excel that's available. There will be one that's available online. And we already have one that's available on the mobile phone, which is integrated with PDR. So you can use that as well for the good for the monitoring system. Second recommendation is to intensify the efforts to strengthen capacity of caregivers to detect and monitor children's wasting status and for quash yorkers using low literacy or numeracy tools at home. You can use and provide them with MUAC tapes and also show them videos. Uh, you can also teach them how to do it during decentralized GMP if you have decentralized GMP taking place. And you can refer to the family-led MUAC capacity building video to get more information on this. The third recommendation is to advocate to the government for innovative decentralized GMP to be done at the community level, which will be covered in the coming slides. So in the second context of some or partial restriction in mobility, we would recommend decentralizing GMP sessions. This includes designating multiple posts per village, which means that you want to have not just a GMP post at the health center level, but you want to have at least one post that targets 20 to 30 under five households per post. This, is, this number is contextual because we know that and we recognize that different contexts have different household sizes. So there's a um, different number of children that are under five per household. There is a difference in the population density as well. So this is just a rule of thumb of targeting 20 to 30 under five households per post. Increase the number of days for GMP per month. This, for example, um, is, a, yeah, this is an example. So to conduct GMP at the community level for four to five days per month at multiple locations for two to three hours per day. So you can say and inform the community that decentralized GMP will be happening at the different posts every first week of the month in the mornings for two to three hours starting at eight o'clock a.m. or something like that. So this allows caregivers to attend, have more options to attend the GMP sessions and not miss out on a monthly GMP screening and to take their children. Also ensure social distancing and proper hygiene standards are maintained and practiced at the GMP post. Some examples of things to consider are to have in place hand washing stations with soap, 
to mark the ground so that where um, you, the caregivers can see where the standing positions are and make sure the standing positions are marked two meters apart. Ask the mothers to bring their own chitanga, skirts, bed sheets, whatever it is, if you are using hanging scales. This is because um, if you are using hanging scales, usually you would use weighing pants, but that means you need to sanitize the weighing pants after every child, which can be difficult and time consuming. So by asking the caregiver to bring their own, own um, equipment or something to use to weigh the child on the hanging scales, this can save us time. But of course you can have the weighing pants as a backup if any caregiver does not bring their own chitanga skirts or sheet. Um, I will go into more detail about utilizing the caregivers to do the actual weighing and taking the muak of the children later on in the presentation. The fourth is to mobilize, select, and train additional volunteers for GMP in the following areas. So obviously, if we increase the number of GMP posts, we will need additional personnel, especially if we are offering GMP in multiple locations and for a longer time um, over a longer period of days. So we will need to mobilize and select more volunteers. Um, I would highly recommend to train them in the proper use of PPEs and in child protection protocols. And here are some of the resources that you can use and the page numbers that you can refer to. Protocol for setting up GMP stations in COVID-19. You can refer to Annex C in the PD Hearth Plus in COVID-19 brief. How to conduct anthro measurements with no touch approach. And the no touch approach basically is to utilize the caregivers and instructing them. So the volunteers would be instructing the caregivers and how to weigh the child. And the volunteers or the CHWs would just be reading the scales or reading the MUAC tapes and recording them. This is beneficial in two ways because first of all, it helps with the no touch approach. The second is because it also builds the capacity of the caregivers and gives them a chance to um, try using the MUAC tape on their own so that they can then use it at home as well later on. So it can be an opportunity to train the caregivers during the time of anthro measurement. You can refer to the measuring child growth tool or the RCC training tool for um, details around this. How to use GMP monitoring sheet. So utilizing low numeracy literacy tools or M health applications. So whatever monitoring tool that you use, it would be good to train the selected volunteers or CHWs in how to use these monitoring tools. Also make sure the training includes how to use mobile phones and make phone calls, especially for areas where there's restriction in mobility and you can't conduct household visits. So then you can conduct the GMP screening questions um, through mobile phones. So make sure that they are familiar with the eight screening questions. A note is to make sure that the additional new volunteers are paired with the experienced CHWs. And I would highly recommend to select volunteers such as local shopkeepers who have to stay in one spot for long periods of time already because of their own personal reasons. And, and these people many times already have experience with re record keeping. So you can um, take, take advantage of that. And I would recommend to train them in the child protection policies. Uh, this is an idea because many times uh, we have people who are already staying in one spot due to their own personal businesses, but they're not always busy throughout the day. Uh, so we were recommending that you utilize those people's times rather than trying to find volunteers and bringing them out of their regular um, 
schedules during the day to try and have them support uh, these GMP sessions. And remember, this is only happening three to four times a month for two to three hours a day. Also use radios or SMS text messaging, megaphones and other media platforms to mobilize the community. Through these media platforms, inform the, the audience of the new GMP locations, who should be bringing their children to those locations, in, inform them not to attend the GMP sessions if the child or another family member is feeling unwell and to go instead directly to the health center. And you can also provide them with IYCF and hearth messages, which are covered in Annex A and D in the PDR Plus COVID-19 brief. So here is Annex A. These, these are just examples of some nutrition radio messages that you can provide. It tells you the topic, the content, and then the word count. Goes through some breastfeeding messages, skin to skin contact messages, um, feeding, complimentary feeding messages, uh, food preparation messages. And in Annex D, it has pre selected six COVID 19 key hearth messages. And so this covers hand washing, breastfeeding, active responsive feeding, food handling, complimentary feeding, and the importance of using separate bowls. The sixth recommendation is to use low literacy numeracy tools, as we mentioned earlier, to keep record of the weights and the MUAC records. Uh, in some contexts, you would also record the height. Make sure you take the phone numbers of the under two children, um, the caregivers with under two children, and so that you can provide the IYCF messages through mobile phone calls later on. Also make sure, or I would highly recommend to use the World Vision PD Hearth GMP application, as I mentioned earlier. And the users of this application would usually be the CHWs or volunteers who take the weights, height, and MUAC information. The benefit of using this application is that it provides the user with the nutritional status of the child immediately. So if you put in the weights or the MUAC measurements into the mobile phones, then it informs the volunteer or the CHW that this child is moderately underweight or this child is yellow for MUAC and needs to be, and then it tells you um, the next step for that child, whether you should refer them to a PD Hearth program or to an OTP or to the health center and so on. It's also useful because it provides IYCF messaging. So it provides and guides the CHWs or volunteers with what, message, what messages to give the caregiver depending on whether the child is growth faltering. So it refers back to the GMP session weight that was taken in three months before or the month before. And then it compares it to today's weight or MUAC measurement. And according to that, the, the appropriate IYCF messaging shows up on the phone and then the caregiver can provide that message to, or the CHW or volunteer can provide that message to the caregiver. We had a lot of positive feedback in Burundi with using this application and the volunteers and CHW said that they feel very confident now um, in the messages that they're providing. And a lot of the caregivers also gave positive feedback saying that many times they wouldn't get uh, messages on what to do with their child if the child is underweight or is growth faltering. But now that they are receiving this feedback from those CHWs and volunteers, and they know it's reliable because it's coming from these mobile phones. The seventh recommendation is to conduct the GMP sessions monthly if possible for early detection of growth faltering. So we want to make sure that we're providing these IYCF messaging and hearth messaging if the child is starting to show growth faltering and yet is not malnourished and is not yet malnourished. You would also refer the underweight children to PD Hearth or other rehabilitation services 
before they become wasted. So wasting is the most severe type of malnutrition and we and it's the most dangerous because uh, it's it can lead to mortality. And so we want to address and rehabilitate rehabilitate the children before they get to the point of wasting, which is when we start seeing growth faltering or when they are starting to show underweight in the mild or moderate underweight status. Proper referral of children. So we would refer underweight or wasted children without medical complications to PD heart. The severely wasted children or children with bipedal edema would be referred to wasting treatment programs or CMAM services where available. The next slide takes us through the GMP referral tree. So in complete restriction, we would use the screening questions for um, screening whether the child is growth faltering or not over the phone. And if the child is not growth faltering, so growth faltering no, then you would just continue the GMP and do the screening question again the month later and give another phone call. If the child is showing growth faltering, uh, group meetings allowed with less than five people. If no, then you would just provide IYCF messaging and hearth messages on the phone or through SMS or a combination of voice calling and SMS messaging. If group meetings are allowed with five or more people, then you would refer the child to the adapted PD hearth program for COVID-19. In contexts where there's some restriction in mobility, you would decentralize GMP. And if there is no growth faltering, then the child just continues with monthly GMP, attending monthly GMP. If yes, there is growth faltering, uh, malnourished, underweight, or wasted, or medical complications. So if the child is not malnourished, and yet is growth faltering, you would provide IYCF and hearth messaging to the caregiver. If yes, and the child is underweight or wasted or has medical complication, you ask yourself, is this child severely wasted or has edema or quash yorker? The answer is no, and the child is only underweight and is moderately and or moderately wasted. Then you would just refer the child to the adapted PD hearth to COVID-19 program. If yes, the child is severely wasted or has edema, medical complications, quash yorker, then you would refer this child to the adapted CMAM or wasting services to COVID-19. The ninth recommendation is to follow up with growth faltering children through either phone calls if possible, or household visits using the no touch approach and social distancing approach. You could refer to Annex C, which is the decentralized GMP checklist for preparations required for decentralized GMP. And then you can also refer to the second section, which is additional guidance for decentralized GMP on how to do the follow up for growth faltering children. personal support required. So as I mentioned previously, since we are increasing the number of GMP posts and we are having GMP for longer, uh, for two to three hours for a longer period of time during the week or more number of days, we will need greater personnel support. In order for you to calculate how much personal support is required, you need the number, of under, uh, the number of under five households in the target community. Then you can use this number to then calculate the personal so personnel support required for decentralized GMP in COVID-19. We recommend that one GMP post targets 20 to 30 under five households. We also need two volunteers, one new volunteer and one experienced CHW per GMP post. 
The reason why we want to pair one new volunteer and with one experienced CHW is because the CHWs will most likely have additional training from before. They are experienced. They have already gone through child protection policy training and so on. Uh, the one new volunteer, um, we, they can be CHWs, but many times it will be difficult. It takes a lot of time to try and train additional CHWs, especially if you want to work through the governmental systems. So what I would recommend, because we need to get this in place quickly, and it needs to be the foundation, um, screening needs to be the, the number one thing that we need to start investing into right now. Um, what I would recommend is to advocate and inform and talk to the district level MOH, Ministry of Health, or provincial level uh, Ministry of Health office and inform them of the importance of nutrition screening, that we need to decentralize GMP to increase the coverage of the screenings. And in order to do that, that we need to have more, more personnel on the ground. And so we don't need to call these people CHWs, but maybe we can call them something else like GMP volunteers or some other volunteers. And we should try and get um, approval from the government to be able to do this, at least for a quick response for now, temporarily. Uh, and so if we do pair one new volunteer with one experienced CHW, we are hoping that we can maintain the quality of the services that are being provided at the GMP. And I would recommend one CHW supervisor for every 15 volunteer CHW pairs. So that's really one CHW supervisor for every 30 people in total. This, the CHW supervisor doesn't have to be another CHW necessarily. It doesn't have to be um, a, a volunteer. It could even be a governmental staff at the district office. It can be a World Vision staff. Um, it could be anyone, but I would recommend that there has to be at least one person overseeing 30 CHW volunteers. And, and then um, there can be follow-up that's done with these CHW supervisors to maintain the quality of services. And also, I would highly recommend having um, feedback meetings with, with the volunteers and then with the CHW supervisors in order for changes to be made if they are facing any challenges quickly. And we'll go through that later in the presentation. So how to calculate personal support required? Here's an example. In village A, there's 100 under five households. Village B, there's 100 under five households. And in village C, there's 200 under five households. So what we would do is since we can have a maximum of 30 under five households per GMP, GMP post, I took 100 under five households in village A and divided it by 30 under five households which gives us 3.33. And this is approximately then three to four GMP posts that are required. So let's say we have limited budget and we're gonna round down to three. So we do the same calculation, divide this by 30, divide 100 by 30 for village B, divide 200 in village C by 30, and then we get three plus three plus seven. I just put this as seven instead of six because uh, when we did do 200 divided by 30, it was closer to seven, so I rounded up. So in total, we require 13 GMP posts for village A, B, and C combined. Then for the number of personnel or volunteers, we take 13 GMP posts and multiply by two because we need two people per GMP post. So in total, we have 26 volunteers or CHWs that are required to, to target village A, B, and C for decentralized GMP. And so, as we said, we need one CHW supervisor for every 30 people. So we have one CHW supervisor for the 26 volunteers. For budgeting, 
Um, I have indicated the budget items that we should consider for decentralizing GMP and COVID-19. I included the number of trainings for GMP volunteers or CHWs, and I would highly recommend having a maximum of 30 people per training. This is in order for us to make sure that we are providing enough one-on-one -on -one support between the facilitator and the uh, participants. And I would even recommend having two facilitators for every 30 people in the training, if possible. Also make sure you budget for weighing scales, especially I would recommend the SECA standing scales if possible. MUAC tapes, um, I would recommend to take into consideration that if you are hoping to do family-led MUAC, you need to count the number of MUAC tapes you'll also be distributing to the caregivers with children under five. So we need several for the GMP post, but we also need several, um, or not just several, we also need a, the number of um, tapes that are needed to be given to the caregivers. Phones or tablets for monitoring. Simple phones for interactive voice calling. So if you are going to be doing a lot of phone call follow-up visits, screening questions over the phones, I would recommend using simple phones instead of smartphones, especially because it may be more difficult to train volunteers in how to use smartphones. And so simple phones are also budget friendly because you can get simple phones for about $15 to $30. And another thing to consider with these phones or tablets is solar chargers. Um, and then SIM cards and airtime, uh, personnel, Personal protective equipment, PPEs, such as masks, gloves, goggles, if available for volunteers and CHWs. Hand washing station equipment or supplies such as soap, tippy taps. I highly recommend using tippy taps because you don't need to touch anything. Um, you don't have to touch the knobs to turn the water on and off. You can just step on something, a stick or something that can then tip the tippy tap over and then you have flowing water on your hands. And if you can mix in the soap into the water, that is fantastic. Uh, make sure you budget for registers, IYCF posters for the GMP posts, incentives for volunteers or CHWs. This is contextual. So it really depends on um, the context because in some countries they require NGOs to provide incentives to the volunteers or CHWs, monetary incentives. Um, and in some contexts, they actually do not allow NGOs to give monetary incentives, but they do allow them to provide non-monetary incentives like hats and t-shirts and so on. So it's really contextual, so I'll leave that up to you. And then some budget for translating the PDHearth GMP M Health application if you would like to use this application. Uh, and then we can contextualize it for your country. The last slide that I'll be going through is supervision. So supervision for the GMP volunteers and CHWs can be done over the phone. Um, and when we did a research study in Cambodia comparing face-to-face um, -face household visits and phone calls to replace those household follow-up visits for hearth sessions, we found that there were actually um, a number of, of pros of using phone follow-up phone calls to follow up with the caregivers and changing their behaviors, um, following up to see if they are, they are facing any challenges and helping them to overcome some of those challenges and so on. Um, one of the difficulties that we had was um, that the phones were actually with the fathers a lot of times and not the primary caregivers. And so we had to inform the caregivers and, or the household to ensure that the phone is with the primary caregiver at least for um, the next however many weeks or during, let's say, the second week of the month something like that, so that you can schedule the calls and make sure that the caregiver or the primary caregiver has a phone at that time. We also found that it was important to supervise the volunteers 
and see how they're making the phone calls to the, to the caregivers. So we would check the call logs because uh, we gave the SIM cards to the volunteers and they were using those SIM cards. So we can check the call logs to see uh, how many phone calls did they make that day? Who did they call? How long were the, the phone calls? We also informed the volunteers and CHWs that we would do spot checks and call the caregivers randomly and ask them what kinds of messages were given, how long did the messages take, how, um, how did they experience the call with the volunteers, and so on. And this was very helpful. I would also recommend monthly feedback meetings, as I mentioned before, uh, where one CHW per pair attends the meeting. So it doesn't have to be both people in one pair um, that attends, but even if just one between the two attends the meeting, I think it's sufficient. And then they can take turns going to the meetings. That way it doesn't take up all of their time. Uh, and spot checking GMP posts to ensure COVID-19 prevention me measures are being taken into consideration, including social distancing, hand washing stations and that they have soap available or hand sanitizer, making sure to sanitize all the equipment after every household's use um, during the GMP sessions, and then the proper use of PPEs. These are all things to consider when you do the spot checks of the GMP posts. Uh, I would also highly recommend to ensure that the GMP data is entered to Excel or online, and that this data is being analyzed so that we can make informed programmatic decisions. So let's say, for example, there are high rates of wasting and it's continuing to increase month by month, then we would probably try to strengthen the wasting treatment program, or we may even do more frequent MUAC screenings. There is um, a three video ENA training, um, training video series that's available on how to analyze the GMP data using the ENA software. Uh, and this is freely available on YouTube. So I can provide you with the links to these videos if you are interested. And you can find these links as well on the PD Hearth um, MS Teams Nutrition Network channel. Thank you for listening. And for more information, please contact GetNet or you can contact Diane as well. Thank you.